Welcome back to our series of presentations on the unification principle, the path to happiness. I'm your host, Dr. Tyler Hendricks. In our last session, we stated that God wants to bring everyone into one great family as his children in the realm of absolute true love, the kingdom of heaven. Now you might ask, to what extent is this all guaranteed? Does God plan everything? Or is everything up to me? Which means it might not work out and nothing is really guaranteed. This is the topic of predestination and we're going to talk about it in this session. Christians are divided between belief in free will and predestination. Everyone agrees that the power of salvation comes from God, but they have different viewpoints about that. Free will thinking, once called Arminianism, claims that God equally provides his power to everyone, and it's up to us what to do with it. Predestination, on the other hand, claims that God chooses who will be saved and who will not, and nothing we do can change that. People such as Augustine, Luther, and Calvin believed in predestination. They argued that God elects some people for salvation while he decides not to elect others, and that God is entirely just and loving in this election. This means that the restoration providence only depends on God. Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, supported something called supralapsarianism, which states that God decided everything before the fall, who would be saved and who would go to hell. It's hard to believe, but it is Christian doctrine. And so the churches become weak because it really doesn't make sense to us. Unification principle clarifies that there are two perspectives. Number one, the predestination of God's will and, number two, the predestination of the way in which God's will is fulfilled. God's will is to accomplish the purpose of creation, and that's also the purpose of restoration. So God determined when he created human beings that they accomplish the purpose of creation, right then and there, Adam and Eve. But when God could not fulfill his will, due to the fall, he determined to fulfill the will in the future through the providence of restoration. And since then, God has been working to accomplish it. God is the absolute being, unique, eternal, and unchanging. Therefore, the purpose of his creation and of his will for the providence of restoration, the goal of which is the accomplishment of the purpose of creation, must also be absolute, unique, eternal, and unchanging. Likewise, God's predestination of his will must also be absolute. So, from this point of view, it is predestined that God's will of perfect love in the family, going on forever with joy in heaven and on earth, will happen. How about the predestination of the way in which God's will is fulfilled? The principles, the natural laws by which things work are set, but God's purpose of creation can be realized only when human beings complete our portion of responsibility. Although God's will to realize this purpose through the providence of restoration is absolute, it's beyond human influence, its fulfillment can change because that is subject to free will. And that depends upon whether or not human beings complete their responsibility. Therefore, God's will to realize the providence of restoration is absolute, but its fulfillment is conditional. God predestines the process of its accomplishment conditionally, contingent upon the 5% responsibility of human beings. 
which must be completed in addition to the 95% responsibility of God. The portion of 5% is used to indicate that the human portion of responsibility is very small when compared to God's portion of responsibility. And yet, for us, this 5% is equivalent to 100% of our effort. Hence, God cannot absolutely predestine what happens to us as human beings. We can become ideal people, as God foreordained for us, only when we complete our responsibility. Therefore, God does not predestine in absolute terms what kind of people we actually turn out to be. Even though God may have a mission planned for you or for me, we have to do our 5% before we can complete it and fulfill God's will. If we don't, we will not become the person that God purposed us to be. For this reason, God's providence of restoration, centered on figures in biblical history, has been prolonged many times because of the failure of the human portion of responsibility. And so we have co-creativity to affect the outcome, to put our own self into it. Now, what about those biblical passages that say that God controls everything, we have nothing to do with it? For example, Paul wrote, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified, Romans 8, 29. He went on to say, I, God, will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, Romans 9. And to the same effect, Paul said, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty and another for menial use? That's also in Romans 9. And continuing with Paul, he wrote that God loved Jacob and hated Esau even when they were still inside their mother's womb. Well, they hadn't done anything good or evil, but God said that the elder is going to serve the younger. It sounds like it was all planned out. These verses are often interpreted to mean that everything in an individual's life, prosperity or decline, happiness, misery, salvation, damnation, as well as the rise and fall of nations, comes to pass exactly as predestined by God. Well, these verses were written for one purpose, to emphasize that God is the subject of the providence of the history of restoration, that God is the Lord, that God is in charge, and that we can trust in God completely because God is righteous and God is loving. And this is very important. And God does have a plan. But at the same time, the doctrine of absolute and complete predestination, which is believed even in our present day, takes it a bit too far and ignores the true relationship between God's portion of responsibility and the human portion of responsibility in the fulfillment of the purpose of the providence of restoration. So we've got to read the Bible comprehensively. If the fall were predestined, then God didn't have to warn Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit in order to prevent their fall. And there would be no reason for God to, to grieve over fallen human beings if we were just doing what God wanted us to do, as in Genesis 6.6. 6. If salvation were predestined, God wouldn't have to say that whoever believes in Christ shall not perish, but have eternal life. Because it wouldn't matter if you believe in Christ or not. He wouldn't say, ask, and it will be given you, Seek, and you'll find it. Knock, and it will be open. Because it doesn't matter whether you ask or seek or knock. It's going to happen anyway. If human beings' birth and old age, sickness and death were all predestined by God, he wouldn't tell us to pray for our sick brothers. 
as in James 5.14. If everything in our lives were determined by an inevitable fate, as predestined by God, no human endeavor, including prayer, or evangelism, or charity, would add anything more to God's providence of restoration. We have to keep in mind that God's providence can be accomplished only when our responsibility, carried out in freedom, is combined with God's responsibility. We're a team. We need cooperation between God and us in the relationship of giving and receiving. The fact that there is human responsibility is a great blessing. God put us in the position of his fellow workers, his sons and daughters. Therefore, we have to try to fulfill our responsibility in the providence with gratitude. When we do so, we can actually liberate God from his suffering heart, because God created us to have a living relationship with him, so that he can finally turn from grief to joy. We see that God does have a plan for each of our lives, and we see that by following the principle and living for others, we will fulfill that plan. But you might ask, centered on what? What's the standard? Yes, I want a great marriage and family, but how does that make me, well, like Jesus? I thought Jesus was uh, God. I, I'm not God, and, and Jesus wasn't married. So am I supposed to be married? Our next session will cover these really important questions. I pray these words may really move your heart. Thank you. For